Good morning, everyone. A happy morning to everyone. And I think you enjoyed yesterday's session. And today is the second day of Companies Act 2017 amendment, amendment rules. So before we proceed, so there are some announcements to be made uh, regarding the future programs of our institute. So one is happening on uh, December 6, which is uh, about uh, litigation practice under direct and indirect tax laws. Uh, that is on the branch premises and one more is on the recent updates on GST law by Anupurna Kavra and one more program on IBC which is happening on 13 December. All of the programs are available online to be registered. Please do kindly get registered. One more thing is that uh, we have launched the I, uh, ICA Bangalore uh, app through which you can register for these programs as well as you can provide feedback. I request each and every one of you to download that program. For your, for your own benefit because uh, we are going to upload all the materials also in that. So in case you miss, on, miss, on, miss to make your notes, you can just download from that. In case you need any other help also, you can approach us through your feedback. You can provide your feedback in, uh, there is a column of event feedback and we'll be uh, using that information for our future program so that we can uh, provide a better service. So it's a personal request and from the committee that uh, it will always uh, add on to the uh, services what we are giving from, on behalf of our institute. So, we are sitting today, uh, today for today's session. Uh, we have with us our speaker here, C.A. Punaras Jayakumar. I was going to present today on the topic Companies Act 2017 and second ordinance and amendment rule 2019. So, let's uh, let's welcome him today, uh, C.A. Punaras Jayakumar on the stage. I request the chairman to accompany him and present him a floor of okay. Please give a big round of applause for today's speaker. Here I have been given a brief profi uh, profile about uh, C. Punarvasan Jayakumar. It's very, uh, very brief but it's not exclusive about him. He is qualified in 2012. He, uh, he has been a regular speaker in CP seminars on corporate law. Uh, he has counseled around 7,000 students in the past 8 years. He is a consultant for corporate and allied law in Bangalore. He is passionate about training and he, he, teacher, he, uh, he started teaching as soon as he cleared his CPT. And he has been a faculty at Bangalore, Mangalore and Ernakulam branches of Institute of Chartered Accounts of India in the topics of mercantile law, corporate law, auditing at the CPT, IPC and final, and final levels. He is a member of Board of Studies of Graduate and Postgraduate Corporate Courses at MLC, MLAC, Autonomous College Bangalore. He is a visiting faculty for law for MBA students at reputed institutions in Bangalore. Apart from that, there is another face of the CA Pranavasa Jayakumar. He is a natural enthusiast and he loves driving, traveling, mountain biking, indulges in the wildlife photography and he has authored a coffee table book about his father's experience in the jungles of Indian subcontinent titled Life in Jungle, Memoirs of a Forester, which is, was successfully released recently. So let, let us congratulate him on this. Thank you a big round of applause for the speaker. Let's welcome the young, young dynamic speaker of the stage, I give you A very good morning to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Bangalore branch of SIRC for having this uh, wonderful two-day program. Uh, it's really needed for all of us to update on the uh, latest amendments and latest changes in the dynamic uh, company's law. Company's law was almost uh, stagnant in 1956, but of late since 2013, the last 5-6 years, it has gone through a sea of changes. Uh, so, whatever I know about the amendments, I would like to share with you. And I would uh, want this to be an interactive discussion session rather than a one-way communication, so that I also can learn from your experience. I can see a lot of uh, uh, stalwarts and senior chartered accountants sitting here. So I am young and I am sure most of your experience will be my age. So it is good even if I learn from you. So let this be an interactive session. Uh, so I will try to make it as interactive as possible. So without uh, further ado, since we are short on time, I would like to finish at sharp 11.30, 11.35. So let's start off. So yesterday in the first session, uh, Madhu and Rao would have probably told you that there are various reasons why the new companies that had to come. So first was of course of the increased responsibility of the board of directors and independent directors and uh, they had to have a thrust on investor protection as well and there was a lot of difficulty in respect of restructuring of companies so uh, the new companies that aimed at easing the concept of restructuring of companies 
So there are few areas, and including the auditor's responsibility as well. So that's the reason why the old act with all, almost 650 odd sections was completely revamped and a new act came into place which had around 470 sections where 230 sections of the old act were completely removed and even some definitions needed some rationalization so they had changed the definition as well. Uh, but 2013 act also was not complete in so many respects because uh, we needed a stark change. So there were six points because of which even 2013 needed a change because of which we got our 2015 amendment act, then we had our 2017 amendment act and uh, IBC also came into the force and now recently 2019 amendment act which has stemmed up from the 2018 ordinance also has come. So it has gone through so many amendments already. So that reason obviously because there were some provisions which I discussed which were inconsistent with the SEBI regulations and of course the CSR regulations were quite stringent so they had, had to harmonize and sort of regularize the uh, provisions of CSR and of course some definitions I discussed today that needed some rationalization so that's the reason why they had to change some of the definitions as well uh, in 2017 as well as 2019 also. And of course, uh, there is this new concept as we all know, the dreaded NFRA that also had to come and that also had to be, to, to be rationalized to some extent. So that's the reason why the new amendments have come in respect of 2015, 17 and 19. So let's, today's discussion is very simple and of course as I told you, the ordinance also has come, it has gone through so many changes, so many uh, times it has been passed and finally now, the ordinance has been replaced by a company's amendment act 2019 which is you know, applicable with retrospective effect from 2nd November 2018. So this is what all the changes are. So today's agenda is very simple. First, I will talk about the important amendments in the Company's Amendment Act 2017, then some important amendments in 2019. Uh, so I don't think so there will be time for this, but it's okay. This, anyway, the slides are there, uh, which has been given to you already. But yeah, these two things we will concentrate on. Uh, probably this can be a separate session some other day. So, Companies Amendment Act 2017 and of course the Companies Amendment Act 2019. So, let's uh, go into Companies Amendment Act 2017, all the changes that have come. Yes, there are around 92 amendments, small amendments, 3 deletions and 3 new sections have been inserted as per the 2017 Amendment Act. So, let us see some important changes. So first one, if you remember in 1956, there was a section called section 45, which spoke about, uh, you, you would have heard the concept of lifting the corporate veil, where if something happens, then the corporate structure of the company is lifted and the directors are uh, made to be liable. But there was no section on members becoming liable. So there was a section earlier in 1956, which spoke about uh, section 45, whereby the statutory minimum number of 7 in case of public company and 2 in case of private company if it reduces then even the shareholders who are cognizant of the fact and if the business is carried on for 6 months they would be personally liable. Now interestingly this section was removed in 2013 but again it has found its way back in 2017 by an insertion of a new section 3 capital A where it says that's what, if for 6 months or more, if the number of members have reduced below the statutory minimum and the company is carrying on business, then after that 6 months, the director shall be, sorry, the shareholders will be liable. The reason obviously is punishment for negligence because you need to maintain the minimum number of 7 and 2. That is one part. Then, a new section has been inserted, 446 capital A. Now, this comes between 446 and 447. 447 again is the section criminal liability for fraud and other things. So between the two, this a lot of doubts were being uh, raised uh, to the MCA with respect to what are the factors that the NCIT will consider before levying some punishment. So in order to rationalize it, they have given a section 446 capital A where they have told it all depends on the size of the company or rather the factors which the court will take into account would be the size of the company, nature of the business, injury to public interest. Now public interest has not been defined as such, but anyway we can take it recourse to various uh, judicial pronouncements. Then the nature of the de default and the repetitive nature of the default. So considering all this, 446A, they have inserted to say that these are the factors that the court should take cognizance before you know charging uh, fine. 
or penalty as such. Then we have one more section 446 capital B. This is for one person company and small companies. So here they say lesser penalty for one person company and small company. Any idea what small companies? Is it a private company or public company? Small company? Anyone? Private company. Yes. Uh, can we uh, tell what would be the paid up capital limit? Yes, less than 50 lakhs, yes. So paid up capital will be less than 50 lakhs and what about turnover? 2 crores, yes. So this for such companies obviously there is, since there is absence of public interest and for ease of business provisions, only for these sections, section 92, default in filing annual return, section 117, that is uh, not filing your MGT 14 and section 137, not filing the financial statements to the registrar. <coughs> Uh, the penalty will be half of the fine and imprisonment. So, whatever the fine and imprisonment are these in the section, exactly half, up to half you can charge for OPC and so this is one more section inserted. So, three sections yes, are inserted. Yes, sir. There is no difference in the fees actually, there is no change in the fees for delay filing for small companies and businesses. Yes, sir. There is no change in the fees. No change, sir. They have made it half, that's all. So, whatever the section says, half of it will be charged no, for OPC. So, for the small company, what are the penalty the fees? Or sir, it's half. Up to half you can charge. 50. Correct. Yes. The limit is the same. The overall amount is the same, but the limit is half for OBC and S. Can we proceed, sir? Yes. Yeah, three sections were deleted because obviously uh, it was already there in the civil regulations. One is the uh, promoter stakeholder changes and then forward dealings in securities. And of course, the entire trading is already there in survey regulation, so hence it's removed here. So, three sections deleted, three sections added. Let's see the important changes as such. One is in the incorporation of the company. The reservation of name, earlier it was 60 days from the date of, you know, application. But now they have changed it to 20 days from the day they have accepted the application as such. So, once they say that, okay, your name is reserved, you will have 20 days. So, indirectly they are trying to tell that we need to... Uh, finish all the obligations within 20 days. So earlier it was 60 days from the day we applied. So here it is 20 days from the day they approve. So they approve, they send an approval letter saying that name is reserved and from there 20 days is where it will be reserved. So that is one change. As far as existing company is concerned that still remains at 60 days itself. It is only for new companies 20 days instead of 60. Then registered office also earlier it was INC 22 now everything is in the spice form and the other one. So it was 15 days, now they have increased it to around 30 days. These are small procedural changes, that's it, in the incorporation of the company. Yes, and as we all know, uh, because of uh, the flurry of uh, sham companies coming into the fore, there are many sections to curtail that which we'll discuss. One is regarding the 186.1, which speaks about the layers of investment company. One more is to subsection 87, which is again layers of subsidiary company. And one more we have a significant beneficial owner in section 90. Apart from that, in order to ensure that the uh, companies are not uh, fr fronts for uh, illegal activities, we have this active, that is active company tagging identities and verification, which has to be filed. And as we all know, it had to be filed before 15 June 2019 where we have to tag the uh, geotag location and other things. And of course, with the uh, picture of the facade of the office and as well as the uh, couple of pictures of the key managerial personnel. This is just uh, one of the uh, ways to curtail the uh, emergence of uh, sham companies of late. So this was one more small change. This came uh, earlier, 25th February 2019. So this was one more change which all of us would have already complied with. Then there is Director's KYC also, the insertion of 12 capital A. Uh, this came via the rules on 30th April. They say every individual has been allotted a DIN on 31st March shall submit DIR 3 KYC on or before 30th June of the immediately next financial year. So new KYC norms are there for the Directors. This is one extra form, DIR 3 has to be filed. 30th June of the immediately next financial year. These are our procedural changes. We'll come to the conceptual changes also. So, we knew in the two sections, that is one is two subsection 6 associate company and two subsection 87 subsidiary company. The percentage was always 20% and more than half. 
but it was always taken on total share capital before total share capital and total share capital was nothing but equity share capital and convertible preference share capital now this has undergone a change in the new act they have now just taken the voting power which is nothing but equity control so that's a major change earlier we had to uh, calculate on both equity share capital and convertible preference share capital and now it is on 20% of the voting power and voting power is equity control so the definition of I mean, they have removed this concept of total share capital and instead of that they have added voting power this is an important change in the definition to subsection 6 uh, also the holding company as you know company is defined in 2 subsection 20 they just say that the company is a company registered under this act it did not speak about foreign holding companies having Indian subsidiaries is a foreign holding company is it a holding company as per companies act was the question so 2 subsection 46 earlier they just defined it to be holding company was a company which was registered under the act so it did not give legal sanction to foreign holding companies having Indian subsidiaries. So again that definition has been rationalized whereby they have now told for the limited purpose of 2 subsection 46 company also includes a body corporate. Now foreign company is a body corporate. So this clears and rationalizes the concept now that obviously even a foreign holding company can have Indian subsidiaries and that foreign holding company Though it is not a company as per Companies Act, it is a body corporate as per Companies Act and that also falls under 2 subsection 46. That is also one important change that has come. So one is regarding 2 subsection 6, equity control and one is 2 subsection 46, body corporate. At any time if you have any doubts, we can stop and we can discuss. Uh, any Anything can I move ahead? Next definition change is to subsection 57. They have changed the definition of net worth slightly. So the earlier definition was paid up share capital, reserves out of profits, security premium account, less your preliminary expense, accumulated losses and deferred expenditure. Now that they have changed it to debit or credit balance of PNL account is also taken into calculation. Apart from all these things, even the debit or credit balance of the PNL account should be taken into calculation in net worth. To just give the correct picture, earlier we were taking it, but now just to give clarity, again the definition has been rationalized to include that as well. And as I told you, uh, to subsection 87, that also has changed to equity control now. It has been changed to more than half of the total voting power rather than total share capital. This has already been discussed. So these are some of the changes in the definition. And new section has been substituted for the old one. This I am talking about section 42 about private placement. So new section has come into place. So the maximum people to whom private placement can be done is 50 or higher people as may be prescribed. So as of now prescribed is around 200. So at a time private placement can be done to 200 people. And yes we need to file a return of allotment that is PAS 3, 4 and 5. And money cannot be utilized until the return is filed. This is a new provision which was not there earlier. So once you make the private placement and you get the money, until obviously you file the return, the money cannot be utilized for the purpose for which it was taken. This is the second one. And if the, anybody does so, the officer in default and the company should pay 1000 rupees per day. It can go up to 25 lakh rupees. This is also a new insertion as per section 42. And interestingly, there was no right of renunciation. So if an offer letter is given to a person, he has no right to renunciate in favor of somebody else. He can just accept it or reject it. He cannot renunciate and give it to somebody else. Like the one we have in right shares, that is not possible in private placement. No right of renunciation. And otherwise, again, there is a fine, that is the amount raised or 2 crore, whichever is less, plus all the money has to be refunded and interest also will be charged. So these are some of the salient features of the new section, section 42, which speaks about private placement. So this is a new section which has been substituted for the old one which was there. These are all some of the changes. Yes, as I discussed, there has been a crackdown against uh, multi-layered entities. So the first crackdown is 186 of section 1, where they speak about layers of investment companies. I will discuss that. And 2 subsection 87, 
which also speaks about the layers of subsidiary companies and uh, section 19 which speaks about significant beneficial owner. So there have been a lot of cases now, the most recent investigation being the uh, Cafe Coffee Day case where they were seeing that you know there were a lot of layers of investment companies and a lot of subsidiaries that were between uh, CCD and uh, one more let me just show you a quick picture of that. So this is an entire analysis of the uh, Coffee Day case. Um, I will not get into any political discussion. This is just for the information of uh, general public as such, which is there in the public domain after all the things that can happen. And uh, we knew that uh, SM Krishna's protege, DK Shukumar, had a daughter. And yeah, now the daughter's company was Nassar's sole space. And when the tax department raided DK Shukumar's premises and the daughter's premises, they found that. Uh, Cafe Coffee Day had given around 20 crore to Mesa Soul Space. So what is very interesting is it had gone through so many layers. So some were layers of subsidiaries and some were layers of investment companies. So then the Companies Act concept will come now where subsidiary companies was under 2 subsection 87 and investment companies is 186.1. Any idea now, as of now, how many layers is permitted, are permitted? As in a holding company can have how many subsidiary companies? Uh, I'll just, you know, probably put it. So is it like this? For instance, uh, CCD was there and Nassar's sole space. This is an actual case that has happened. There was an investment company one, investment company two, and there were so many. But what I am asking is, is this correct or should it be just investment company 1 and Mesa sole space? The first one. First one? Yeah. Yes. Because 186 one uses the word through two layers. Through two layers. So CCD was the first company, sole space was the second one. Through, which means maximum number of investment companies can only be two. Interestingly now, if this investment company happened to be a subsidiary of Cafe Coffee Day and even investment company too happened to be a subsidiary of Cafe Coffee Day and then it invested in Soul Space. Is this allowed? My first example, was, this is correct, this is I mean obviously wrong but whatever you told was correct here where the first company is CCD, the last company is Missile Soul Space and assuming in between them there were two companies Investment company that is fine because in 186 one it says through two layers of investment companies. Now my question was if this happened to be a subsidiary, investment subsidiary one and investment subsidiary two, and then that invested in Mesar Soul Space, would that be allowed? No, because in two subsection 87 they have changed the rules from 2017 September where they say that one holding company can have maximum two layers of subsidiaries two layers of subsidiaries. The key word in 186.1 is through. So if it's just an investment company that can be the first company CCD and the last company Mesa Soul Space and in between them you can have two investment companies. But if that investment companies happen to be subsidiary of CCD then you can only have Cafe Coffee Day investment subsidiary 1, investment subsidiary 2 and that's it. So these are the two major changes. Based on this, in this entire case, they analyzed whereby it was a blatant violation of both two subsection 87 and 186.1. Uh, this was the initial picture because of which they unearthed the entire scam. Probably some other day, probably we could do this. The entire scam was unearthed, and then it unfortunately led to the. I mean, it all came into light after the unfortunate death of uh, Sri G. Siddhartha. So this is the uh, entire scheme of things. So one holding. So but one interesting thing to notice: can a holding company have subsidiary one, subsidiary two, subsidiary three? Subsidiary, is this allowed? Yes. The layers should be read as only vertical integration. Vertical integration is not is what is not that is not allowed. Horizontally, you can have as many. I mean, you can't call it a layer, but as many. Horizontally, you can have as many subsidiaries as you want, but the key here is the vertical integration, maximum two. And also, one more interesting thing as per the rules is this allowed holding company, subsidiary one, wholly owned subsidiary one, let's say, subsidiary two, 
and wholly owned subsidiary 2. What about this? Is it 4 layers or 2? So as per the rules they have set, wholly owned subsidiary layers must be ignored. Wholly owned subsidiary layers must be ignored. So still this holding company has just 2 layers. S1 and S2. This is as per the rules. Now a question may arise, what happens to those companies which have 10 layers, 20 layers, 40 layers as on September 2017 when this rule came into force. Should they now divest and then uh, stick to two layers or what was the doubt? So they said that provisions are grandfathered. So if any company has let's say around 70 layers as such, so that those provisions are, I mean those 70 subsidiaries are okay, no problem. So these are some of the changes that have come in the new law. So only one subsidiary layer has to be ignored, right? So these are the changes. Uh, any doubts here? What happens if there is an investment company uh, below the holding company and a subsidiary? Let me write down, sir. Tell me, sir. Uh, there is a holding company. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, there is an investment company. Okay. Uh, that comes a subsidiary. Okay. Uh, but can they have, if there is a break, uh, investment company, then a subsidiary, then an investment company below it? That's fine, sir. Okay. Again, but the thing is now it has gone through two layers already. That, so that again would be a problem. It doesn't uh, break it. Yes, correct. It should the uh, investment should go through two investment companies as per one ABC. So. Right. So then we have section 90 which speaks about the significant <coughs> beneficial ownership, uh, which we'll discuss. It came on 15th of 2018, and then on February 2019, MCA issued the SBA amendment rules. So here it's very simple again, the issue was the misuse of multi-layer corporate entities. Uh, so to curb this from happening, this is what they uh, tried doing. Uh, this again was an allegation raised, just to give a practical example, an allegation raised in Rendezvous Sports Private Limited, which was the owner of uh, Kochi Tuskers, the IPL team. And uh, Dr. Sunanda Pushkar was uh, the director there. And it was alleged that there were some feedbacks given to Dr. Shashi Tarur through various layers and the uh, significant beneficial owner of all those shares were, was actually Dr. Shashi Tarur. I mean that is still, uh, the investigation is still going on. Uh, but these are the allegations which are there now, uh, which, were, which are investigating. And the only person who actually knew about it was uh, Dr. Sunanda Pushkar. So anyway, so regarding that, the new rules have come, SBO rules. So the SBO rules, they are, the concept of SBO is already there in the Benami Transaction Prohibition Act and your uh, foreign portfolio investment regulations already there. But anyway, just to give uh, the concept, there is a person called the registered owner, obviously. He is not the actual uh, owner of shares, but his name is entered in the register of members. He is a registered owner. He is not entitled to dividend as such, uh, but he has voting rights in the company, can vote on poll and he will be, be counted for quorum. But basically he is the holder of shares, he is called as the registered owner. His name appears in the register of members, but he may not be the owner of shares as such. Whereas the beneficial owner, as for the definition it says, every individual who acting alone or together or through one or more persons or trust holds beneficial interest in the shares. So he is the actual owner of the shares, only his name may not be entered in the register of members but he is entitled to all the beneficial interests like dividend and other things. So to sort of dissect the rules, we can just basically a beneficial owner can go through, can go through a resident or can be non-resident as well or he can go through a trust as well and invest in Y Limited. That's how it is done. But to give a sense of the entire thing, the rules say that the shareholding should be more than 10%. So the shareholding should be more than 10% as per the rules and a declaration has to be done, we will see that BE and 1, BE and 2, those are the declaration that has to be filed by the company and third one of course is uh, if you do not follow these things then section 447 the penal provisions will get attracted. So let's just uh, try and understand the concept here. So the first check that I should see is the SPO, the significant beneficial owner should be a natural person. This is the first check. The second check for the auditors to check would be such person should hold at least 10% of shares or voting power or dividend or control directly along with indirectly. So it is very clear indirect holding along with direct holding. So the crux of the matter, the third check that we have to see, there has to be indirect holding. So the first check natural person, 
Second one, 10% of shares. Third one, there should be indirect holding. If I have directly hold 11%, then I will not be called as a significant beneficial owner. So if I let's say have 3% directly and 8% indirectly or 9% directly, 3% indirectly, then I will be called as a significant beneficial owner. So first important thing, natural person. Second check, 10% of shares and third check should be indirect holding. Now what is this indirect holding is the next question. Again the rules are needed to dissect this concept. What do you mean by indirect holding? Now if I use the word indirect, it can, we can go on and on, there is no end to it. So what is exactly indirect holding? So I will just uh, uh, try and explain that. So let us consider an example, Mr. A who is a significant beneficial owner. Now he has to hold, as per the rules, more than half of the shares of a body corporate. And as we know, body corporate can be a private company, public company, statutory corporation, foreign company, a limited liability partnership, nationalized bank or financial institution. Now this body corporate, if it holds more than 10% or equal to 10% of the reporting company, we are the auditors of the legal principles of this reporting company. Now then this person, Mr. A will be called as a significant beneficial owner. So person Mr. A holds more than half of a body corporate and the body corporate holds less than, greater, sorry, greater than or equal to 10% of this reporting company Then, from this reporting company's point of view, Mr. A is called as a SBO. This is one part of the rules. Second, SBO that is uh, Mr. A in my example again has invested more than half in this body corporate and this body corporate is a partner in this partnership firm and the partnership firm is holding greater than or equal to 10% in this reporting company so Mr. A will be called as significant beneficial owner right then Mr. A directly is just a partner of this partnership firm and this partnership firm again holds greater than or equal to 10% in the reporting company then again Mr. A will be called as a significant beneficial owner. Fourth, SPO Mr. A is a karta, mind you not a co-parsoner as per the rules but a karta of a Hindu undivided family and the Hindu undivided family holds greater than or equal to 10% of the shares in the reporting company then again what is it again Mr. A is called as a significant beneficial owner this is uh, dissecting the rules this is how we can make out then last but not the least Mr. A is a trustee of this trust Mr. A is a trustee of this trust and the trust again holds greater than or equal to 10% of the shares of the reporting company so this is the entire scheme of things with respect to indirect holding so from the reporting company's point of view, it, if it has gone through HUF, partnership firm, trust or a body corporate and everything behind all these entities you have Mr. A in this structure. As per the rules, then Mr. A is deemed to be the significant beneficial owner. Now the Companies Act uh, gives the owners of declaration both to Mr. A and also the responsibility to check all this on the company. And the auditor has to report whether the company has reported on the existence of significant beneficial owners. So, is this structure clear? Can we proceed? Yes. So, test for SEO disclosures I have discussed. First, there has to be a natural person without a doubt. Individual having beneficial interest not less than 10% of shares as discussed. And I told you it should be indirect holding along with direct holding. And holding of what? It can be anything. GDR, your normal equity share, friend share capital, convertible uh, preference shares, convertible debentures, everything. Cumulative convertible debentures. Yes. An individual should hold a majority stake in the member body corporate as discussed here. This majority stake in the member body corporate is what they say. Only direct holding shall not be considered as SBO. This is obvious because it's a significant beneficial owner, not a registered owner. So that's the thing. The first disclosure is BN1. That has to be done. Every SBO should do. So in my example, Mr. A should file a declaration in BN1. Then whenever there is any change, again SBO shall file any change in his SBO significant beneficial ownership within 30 days to the company. And when 
every individual becomes an SBO if he follows that criteria, then he has to file again BEN 1 to the company within 30 days of acquiring such significant beneficial ownership. So, SB, uh, SBO, the onus is on the SBO to file a declaration BEN 1. This is under the rules. So, this is compliance by the SBO. Second, compliance by the company. First, they have to maintain a register where the interest is declared by the individual. Second, they should file a return BEN2 with the ROC within 30 days from the date of receipt of BEN1. So once the compliance point number A is done by the SPO, then the company should file BEN2 within 30 days. And also the register shall be maintained in BEN3. And of course as auditors, you need to check whether the company is uh, has complied with the provisions and as well whether the SBO has complied with the provisions as such. Yes, uh, then compliance for professional as discussed, have, we have to check as discussed whether the EN1 is received, is not received, the company has sent a notice to such persons if they are aware that there is a significant beneficial owner or not, whether the company has taken action in the tribunal, all these things has to be checked by the auditor concerned. And as far as the director, officer and default, yes, they should, it is onus is on them to see whether there is any beneficial owner of the shares of the company and whether there is any holding company or whether there is any subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary, associate company, all these things. So they have to follow this process, otherwise the penal provisions will be levied. These are all the changes with respect to section 90. So, uh, section 89 and 90 have been amended and section 90 is a new one, which speaks about significant beneficial ownership. Now moving on to uh, AGM and EGM, we have section 96 and section 100 speaks about annual general meeting and extraordinary general meeting. What are some of the changes? Uh, can you hold an AGM outside India? No. Okay, can I hold an AGM, uh, let's say if my registered office is in Bangalore, can I hold an AGM, let's say in Mumbai? Possible to hold a consent to all the shareholders Yes, sir. Correct. So, those are some of the changes. So, let's discuss. So, a holding company, a foreign holding company, which has a wholly owned subsidiary in India, AGM should be held in India. This I am talking about a foreign company, a foreign company, holding company, having a wholly owned subsidiary, mind you, wholly owned, 100%. The AGM shall be held in India, whereas EGM may be held outside India, the extraordinary general meeting. This is one small change. AGM has to happen in India, whereas EGM can, may be held outside India. One more change, a holding company obviously, foreign company with an Indian subsidiary, not a wholly owned subsidiary but an Indian subsidiary, AGM and EGM both should happen only in India. The only thing is foreign company with a wholly owned subsidiary, EGM may be held outside India. And AGM of a listed company should always happen in the registered office or place where registered office is situated. So, for that question where a uh, registered office is in Bangalore, but can I hold it in Mumbai? If it is a listed company, not possible. Even if unanimous decision by shareholders is passed, then it is not possible. So, this is a registered office or place where RO is situated. However, if it is an agent of unlisted company, they say anywhere in India with unanimous resolution. Anywhere in India with unanimous resolution. So, this is what they say. One more place where unanimous resolution is given for the shareholders is section, uh, you know, this is one part. I and mean, for the shareholders, one more is section 162, which speaks about uh, appointing three directors at once. So, there also they have spoken about unanimous resolution. So, two, three places they have spoken about unanimous resolution of the shareholders. Otherwise, when they just, when the act uses the word resolution, it generally seems to be the ordinary resolution, unless specifically they are mentioned special resolution. But couple of places in the Companies Act they have used uh, unanimous resolution. This is for the shareholders part. For the directors anyway we have uh, section 186 which speak about uh, unanimous resolution of the directors. So this is, uh, these are a couple of changes in the uh, AGM and EGM aspect as per Companies Amendment Act 2017. Uh, there was one more thing, section 101 that is notice of the meeting. Notice of the meeting should be given 21 clear days before the meeting. Sorry, 21 clear days before the meeting. Notice of every general meeting, be it the AGM or EGM, should be given 21 
clear days before the meeting. But along with these notice, obviously all the other documents accompanying the notice would be your financial statements, auditor's report, board report. Should that also go 21 days before the meeting or can that go at a shorter time was the question. And one more thing, can the notice also go at a shorter duration, less than 21 days was one more question. So what was there in the uh, old act, that is uh, 2013 initially, and that has become old now. So shorter notice, it said 95% of the members, if they give consent, then shorter notice is possible. Shorter notice is possible, that is less than 21 clear days. And as, as we know, clear days would be uh, 2 plus 2 again, if you are sending via post, the date of sending the notice and the date of the meeting has to be excluded and uh, 2 days postal transit has to be taken into consideration uh, by reading section 20 along with the rules. As far as 137 is concerned, now 101 speaks about notice of the meeting, whereas 137 talks about all the documents, that is your financial statements, annual report, board report, all the documents. Can that be circulated, that should be circulated 21 days before the meeting as for the section, but could that have been circulated at less than that 21 clear day? So there was a problem with uh, synchronizing both the provisions, because 101 the notice said that you can do it at a shorter duration, but there was no provision with respect to the documentation. However, it was mentioned in the rules that you can do it less than 21 clear days. The new act, that is 2017, has amended it and has inserted, there was no shorter notice uh, provisions in the section in 2013. In 2017, they have inserted a proviso where they have synchronized both the provisions. So what are the changes now? There was no uniformity before. What is the change now? Very simple. 101 section, 21 clear days before the meeting, you have to send. Shorter notice, AGM, 95% of members. It's not unanimous, it's 95% of members. Mind you, it is 95% of members and not 95% of voting power. It is 95% of members. Whereas for EGM, they say majority of members and 95% of value of the paid up capital. So that's a big change here. Earlier it was just 95% of members both for AGM and EGM. Now they say 95% of members for AGM and a majority of members and 95% of value of the paid up capital for the EGM as such. However, here also they have made it uniform and rationalized. Earlier it was 21 clear days, even now it is there. But a proviso has been added and now they have told a shorter I mean, the documentation also can be sent at a shorter duration uh, in synchronizing with 101, where again they say majority of members and 95% of value. So this synchronization has happened uh, by virtue of 2017 Act. There is a proviso that has been inserted. So this is one more change. Shorter yes, notice means one or two days also. Sir? Shorter. It's ideal, sir, but only for practical difficulties as such. But if 95% members have agreed, then it can be. Uh, yes. So yes, sir. Sir, please. 21 plus 2 plus 2. Yes, sir. If it is sending, uh, if I are sending via post, it is 21 plus 2 plus 2. Because the plus 2 is for postal transit if you are sending via post. Uh, the other two uh, would be obviously date of sending the uh, notice and date of the meeting have to be excluded. If you are sending by mail? By mail, then it's 21 plus 2. Yeah, that's the general understanding. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the morning, the director said I vote the AGM in the evening. Okay. Short of notice. Everybody is agreeing. All the members are agreeing that I vote it in the evening. Sir, theoretically, it is possible. Theoretically, yes, it is possible. But of course, practically, it, it may not. No, no they say that they will maintain the records also, circulate everything, all the paper work. So, sir, in my opinion, theoretically, yes, but practically, I mean, I don't know how that would happen. Uh, where yeah. Right. Yes. So these provisions again, we have to see whether it's applicable to private, public. There are so many sections. Uh, there was a notification released on 5th June 2015 where they have uh, told for so many provisions of Companies Act, uh, the articles will override for private companies. Yeah, Yes, sir. Afternoon, they sir, board meeting or shareholders? Board meeting not through morning. Afternoon, they are not available for next time. That is possible, sir. Yes. And it's all physically signed documents, short note, everything signed. Yeah, that's what. So, these provisions, if you if we follow, then it would be possible. Most of the time, we see that the short note is concept is only taken for the date of the general meeting. That is, we notice. Is it necessary to include the other section also in that? 
which one? Yeah, sir, earlier that's what? Do you, you mean to say 137? No, no, in the short run is consent. Huh. Typically, you know, the consent is drafted in such a way that it is only about the we need, you know, for that 21 period days notice, we are not able to give. You are asking for a short run. Yeah. Is it necessary to mention in that state short run is consent? Yeah. That yeah. The documents. Ideally, yes. I thought sir, earlier it was not there at all, but via rules they said that both are the same. So along, you cannot just send a notice uh, without the documents. So the rules said that you know uh, once you send the notice, documents also should be sent within that time to maintain uniformity. Now since that section is there, it is better secretarial practice to add that section as well while sending the notice 101 and 137. And the short notice also not defined. As well. What is short notice? So there is no concept of short notice. What I told is lesser than 21 days. Yes. So unless the secretarial standards say otherwise, that I am not sure. Maybe Sundaresh sir can throw some light, sir. One day, one day was a gap. One, one day. day. One day. Yeah. One day. Yeah. So that was not a They have done away with that also. Yeah. So, so, so then morning we can uh, yeah. call and okay. so. So when we have Sundaresh sir, we can clear for all those doubts. Thank you, sir. Can that be entrenched in the articles itself, uh, where we don't have to go? Keep going to the shareholders again and again. Uh, yeah, if the entrenchment provisions are there, then yes sir, 5 of section 4, if that is followed, then it is, but for then again, for that also for a private company, unanimous resolution is needed to insert the entrenchment provisions. So the article says that a shorter notice is allowed? For a private company, it's fine sir, because entrenchment provisions for private company, uh, you need a unanimous resolution to insert the entrenchment provisions, so in that way it is possible. Uh, anything else? So as sir said, it's just uh, one day also has been done away with. So uh, you have to read the secretary standards as well. So morning you can give, and if they have agreed, it is possible. And for better secretary practice, it is always ideal to mention both the sections, 101 and 137. Yes, as far as CSR is concerned, uh, there are a couple of changes as well. So if I just take this example where uh, 11, 12, just random years have taken, you can take the recent years. 16 crores, 12 crores and 20 crores and total means coming up to 8 crores. Earlier the the uh, wordings used were any financial year. So it did not say previous 3, it just said any financial year. But then again they gave a clarification saying any financial year should be any of the past 3. Because one is the applicability, second is the amount to be spent. Amount to be spent was always 2% of the average uh, profits of the last 3 years. That was clear. But the applicability was any of the previous financial years. Now any of the, pre the pre previous financial year can be 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I mean, that interpretation can be taken. That's the reason why they changed it saying that the rules. They, they said that any of the three financial years. That was there. So now however, they have clearly used the word in the immediately preceding financial year. So all I, for this is for the applicability mind you. The other thing the Amount and the percentage has not changed. It is. It still remains two percent of the average three years net profit. That calculated as per one ninety eight. That still remains. I am talking about the applicability of CSR. Applicability of CSR earlier was any of the three years, which is nothing but any of the past three years, and now they have made it immediately preceding financial. So if I think about it, I'm standing here in fourteen fifteen, immediately preceding financial years twenty crores. It would be applicable, but when I go to that two percent, obviously then not possible because there is a loss of eight crores. So that is fine. But what I'm talking about is the applicability. Applicability, there is a change in the wordings. It is immediately preceding financial year. What is penalty for non-compliance? Sir, I'll, I'll discuss that. That also there is a change. Yes, and there was a doubt, but is it required that a company should uh, be in existence for three years for compliance of CSR? If let's say I have been there since two years and I have made profits, so will CSR apply? So that also has been addressed in 2017, where the company has not completed the period of three financial years in its corporation during such immediately preceding financial years. Also has been taken into account. This is for the payment of 2%. That also has been taken into account. As far as the uh, NRT is concerned, these are the things. So unspent amount, these are the changes as per the company's amendment back 2019. Unspent amount, uh, so obviously we need to spend 2% and any unspent amount shall be transferred to a fund set up under uh, Schedule 7 in a period of 6 months of the expiry of the financial year. Unspent amount relating to ongoing project, if there is any ongoing project 
it should be transferred to unspent CSR account within 30 days from the end of the financial year and it has to be used within 3 years if there is an ongoing project can be set aside to the separate account called unspent corporate social responsibility account in 30 days and it should be spent within 3 years if not done so then again point 1 will come where it will go to the fund set up under schedule 7 and the penal provisions 50,000 to 25 lakh rupees company has to pay and the officer in default imprisoned up to 3 years or minimum uh, 550,000 can go up to 5 lakh or both and it is interesting to know it is a, a compoundable offence they have not used the word and they have used the word or so it is a compoundable offence so offence can be compounded nevertheless uh, in the old act it was different in 2013 I always refer it to the old act that it has become old uh, 2013 act says that uh, you either comply or explain those were the wordings you either try to comply with the 2% or explain in the board report why you were not able to comply with the same now those things have changed this is the new act 2019 amendment act with retrospective effect from 2nd November 2018 so here we have to spend one more question arises if I spend more can I take credit of the same or can I carry it forward to the next year no that the uh, ICI FAQ also addresses that issue and one more thing that uh, the rules clearly say that CSR uh, any CSR activity if it is making a surplus or a profit that cannot be obviously taken as income but how would we account for it is the next question so ICI has released a guidance note uh, any idea what should be done like if I have got back some amount because CSR activity I have spent let us say 2 crores but I have got back around 20 lakhs because of the a project or because of some event that I have done, there is a profit of 20 lakhs. So, should I subtract it from my expenses or should I show it as an income was one question. But uh, the rules clearly say that CSR activity, the profit cannot be, I mean, you cannot show it as a surplus. But for accounting purposes, Institute has given a guidance note where they say, what is income? Income is anything that is derived from other than equity participation. Now obviously this is not given by equity shareholders, so obviously any surplus made from CSR activity has to be recorded as income in the books. But what would I do, since I cannot take it on board, so I have already credited to my PNL account, what would I do? So as per institute guidance now they say to create one liability immediately, CSR liability immediately in the uh, PNL account so that that liability is created in the balance sheet. So on first side credit you will obviously take the extra money that the company has made and then there will be this liability also for recording purposes and if I spend more obviously I cannot carry forward all those things and if I had not spent earlier it was either comply or explain but now these penal provisions are there as per the new one. Yes sir that can be used because the liability is there that can be used but then sir uh, that 2 percent will still remain you cannot use it as part of the 2 percent over and above 2% you have to use that, you cannot use it as part of it, that is what, the extra amount that you have made or whatever cannot be carried forward and subtracted from that 2% the next year, that is as per the ICI guidance now, this was released around couple of years ago, that still remains the same. Prosecution has reported, I think, Sir, my opinion this remains the same. Ah, that, yes, that, this still, it is going on. You are not notified. Not different, yes. That, uh, for ease of business, that last part, yeah, within the room. yes, sir. But as of now, in the act, it is still there. Sir. And there is one more uh, uh, proposal by a committee on the amendment of the act again going to the problem now. Yes, sir. Yes, correct. Instead, we can bring back 1950. <laughs> that is easier, sir. Correct. That is easier, sir. Yes. So many changes. Excuse me. Of yes, sir. So here, the amount not spent, uh, as on 31st March 19, they have to transfer within 6 months. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Huh. Sir, this is with the effect from 2nd November. So, in my opinion, the previous ones will be grandfathered. This is with the effect from 2nd November 2018. So, from 31st March 2019, in my opinion. If there is any other view, probably you can share that. Sir? Uh, as far as auditors is concerned, there was one concept of ratification where in 139 they said every auditor shall be appointed at the first annual general meeting and the appointment shall be valid till the sixth annual general meeting 
and every AGM the auditor has to be ratified. Now ratified was it reappointment? No, because 139 one said shall be appointed for five years. So basically from the first AGM and the sixth AGM, the appointment term was five years. So second, third, fourth, fifth, all this was the concept of ratification. And ratification, common parlance would obviously be an approval by passing an ordinary resolution. Now this has rightfully been removed because for, for example, if an auditor has been appointed from the first stadium to the sixth stadium, then if I remove this person in between first and sixth stadium, then obviously I would have to follow 140 subsection 1, which speaks about central government approval and special resolution. So now I am giving a more relaxed provision of ratification here and thereby the auditor can be removed by not ratifying that person without following 140 subsection 1. So that provision uh, has been removed, the ratification has been removed now. So it's very simple, every auditor has to be appointed from the first AGM till the sixth AGM and if we want to remove an auditor, the only route available to the company is 140 subsection 1, the so extra protection to the auditor which has to go through the central government route and of course the special resolution route. So this 139 subsection 1, one proviso was there which spoke about ratification it has rightfully been removed as per the Companies Amendment Act 2017. Sir, most of the companies are still using ratification. I see many, sir? I see many AGM notices where say ratification. Yes sir, but now it's removed. It should not be using that. Ratification is no longer. Not required. Not required. Yes. 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 Uh, 2017, uh, if I am not wrong, uh, sometime in May 18 or something this came, so it's not applicable from that case. Before that, then uh, for removal and uh, resignation, 140 subsection 2, for resignation earlier the fees, well, if the reason, resignation reason is not given in uh, ADT 3, then the uh, penalty was 50,000 rupees to 5 lakh rupees earlier and there were practical concerns where the audit fee was 10,000 rupees and if the reasons are not filed for resignation then the auditor had to cough up 50,000 rupees. So that's the reason why that also thankfully changed and now it is, it is lower of 50,000 and audit fee, whichever is less obviously, audit fee of 50,000 is less and now one more thing they have added is uh, continuing failure, continuing failure 500 rupees per day, it can go up to 5 lakh. So it, the onus is on the auditor to file ADT 3 giving reasons for resignation. Where is uh, one more thing that has come up. But thankfully the penal problem they have reduced it to the lower of 50,000 now audit. Do you see any, any, uh, any country across the globe, this type of practice of per day, 1000 rupees, per day, 500 rupees across the globe and ask? So whatever I have seen I have not come across it. That's what I am saying. So this, this provision basically I feel only for a listed company, but companies like Kondla Capital, uh, you know, this is all completely draconian actually. Yes sir. So as sir said, it's better to go back to 1956. Yes, but I think this is one of the reasons for economic slowdown also in the country. Definitely, sir. I agree. So one small doubt, sir. Yes, sir. No, all the companies have to appoint auditor for five years. Yes, sir. Not one year. Ideally, no, sir, because the word, even the FAQ was raised by ICI, because the wordings are very clear, shall be. Unless it's the first auditor, sir. First auditor of the company after incorporation, that person's uh, tenure will be the next agent, conclusion of the first agent rather. So after that, it shall be five years. There are two views to it. Some people feel it can be one agent, other agent, but the institute had released an FAQ a couple of years ago where they said it said shall be. So when the act uses the word shall, it is mandatory in nature. So shall be from first to sixth stage. And of course, subject to rotation under 139. Now after that, if there are two terms of five years for a firm, then there has to be, uh, if it is a company where rotation applies, then there has to be a break of five years. Sir. In case of a duly incorporated company, yes, sir. when the AGM is yet to come, yes, the company has incorporated in September or something, yes, sir. do they need to file ADT 1 during the first year? No sir, because again if you see 139.1, 139.1 uh, 139 proviso says they use the word such appointment. Like 139 one speaks about subsequent auditor and then they say uh, before such appointment, before such appointment everywhere. So before such appointment, a certificate has to be filed from the auditor. Then again, it says before such appointment, company has to file eighty. So if you there is a, a Supreme Court decision also with, on the word such, it only takes the uh, preceding sentence, which is one thirty nine one. 
So technically for casual vacancy appointment, first order appointment, ADT1 is not needed. But by our rules, they have mentioned that uh, before such appointment, a certificate has to be done. Uh, that certificate has to be filed for both uh, first order as well as casual vacancy. But there is no such rule for ADT1. So in my opinion, it is only for the subsequent order appointment, not for the first order, not for the casual vacancy. So the form it has, but uh, as per the law, but there are some discrepancies in the law as well as the form, sir. That's also there. That is that yesterday in the, the, uh, the speaker said it has to be filed. Yeah. So Sundarajan will be a better person I think in this way, whether it should be filed or not, sir. Did you want? Yeah. Did you for the first order. Yes. So even for other forms it connects to ADD1. Yes. So you do have a choice. Yes. It should be filed. Yeah. Because other forms are connected to ADD1. Sir, but legally, uh, is it needed, sir? Because not legally, not legally, not. Legally, not. Legally, not. Correct. It is. That's what I said. There's a discrepancy between the law and the practice, so that has to be done. Because if you do not file the form, that everything is connected to that. Number will not pass. Number will not be connected. Next, next. Is that a number? Is it? Okay. But the thing is, if you see, read the section, it very clearly says such a point. So technically, uh, the uh, what do you say? It's not needed. But since it's uh, sir said connected to all the forms, uh, we have no choice but to file unless they have made changes in the uh, form itself. Uh, because 139 is uh, very clear in that respect. It says before such appointment. That's it. Yes. Uh, then 141. There was some changes in the there was some changes in the eligibility and qualification. That's fine. Uh, where the uh, other services auditor cannot go through that again 144 also there is a link to it then of course 147 penalty for contravention the auditor earlier it said auditor is liable to pay damages to any person now this was very vague who is this any person that's the reason why the new act thankfully they have told that it's liable only for incorrect or misleading statements made in the audit report and only to members and creditors of the company so that any person has been changed thankfully to members and creators of the company and earlier all the partners of the firm were held liable but now only the guilty partner or the partners who aided or abetted or committed the fraud are liable for criminal penalty and also penalty under 447. So these are the two uh, good changes thankfully protecting the uh, other auditors of the firm. Then a uh, few minor changes, resident director, it was 180 days in the previous calendar year that they have made uh, 180 days in the financial year concerned. And as far as uh, independent directors concerned, every director appointed under section 160 had to give a deposit of 1 lakh rupees which would be uh, refunded to that person after he is appointed or if he gets more than 25% of the valid votes. Even if he loses the appointment, it's okay but he should uh, at least lose with some honor, more than 25% at least, but that has been dispensed with for an independent director because generally the uh, board and the nomination and elimination committee themselves recommend, so there is no point of just taking 1 lakh rupees and then refunding it to the independent director after his appointment. So that has been dispensed with for all the directors who have been recommended by the nomination and remuneration committee and also by the board. And, uh, one interesting thing is our disqualification under 164 which has gone through a couple of changes which uh, just want to talk about it for like 5 minutes. So one we had uh, 164 subsection 2 uh, which spoke about and for 164 subsection 1 which spoke about your moral turpitude and all those things whereas the interesting thing was 164 subsection 2 which speaks about the filing of the annual accounts and the annual returns for three continuous years or other non-filing of the same and one more was your uh, triple D points which your dividend, deposit and debentures and interest thereon on deposits and debentures and this failure continues for one year or more. Now the question that was there, this was in 2013, let's discuss. Uh, let's say Mr. A was a director of X limited. Now this is a company which has committed the default. Let's say default of 164.2 and let's say is also a director of Y limited which is a non-defaulting company. 
The question was very simple. Will he be disqualified in both the companies? Can he continue in one company or will he be allowed to be reappointed in the other company? There are two different concepts. This is disqualification which happens at the point of entry and one more is vacation of office which happens immediately. So the question in 2013 was, a person who was, who was part of a company which has not filed annual accounts, annual returns for three years. So basically here, every year you need to file both. So both have to be filed, only then there is no problem. Even if you haven't filed one of the two and if that problem continues for three years, then the director would be disqualified. So the only way where we can get saved is you have to file both for three years. If you haven't filed at least one and it continues for three years, then the director would be disqualified. But the interesting amendment is, the question is this, in 2013 earlier, what was the thing? Uh, two questions, one, will the director be vacated immediately? If yes, in which company or companies, whether in both the companies or only in the defaulting company. Second question was, will the same director be eligible to be reappointed? So every reappointment is a fresh appointment. That was the question. Uh, so any thoughts on that? Then we'll see what the changes were. Should he vacate in the defaulting company or all companies? Except the defaulting company. Okay, that was in 2013. It, it said that 167 just said that the auditor, the office of the director shall become vacant whenever there is a disqualification under 164. Simple. So that was the uh, way they 164 do that is. That's what they said. Of course, 164 which includes both 1 and 2. Now there is a change by a proviso in 167.1. There is a proviso which says that if you are disqualified under 164.2, then you will have to vacate your office in the defaulting or non-defaulting company? Non yes, non-defaulting company. In non-defaulting company, we need to vacate the office immediately. In defaulting company, we can continue. Mind you, this is only for 164 subsection 2. 164 subsection 2, the proviso doesn't cover 164 subsection 1. So under 164 subsection 1, the old pro, uh, interpretation remains, whereby we have to uh, vacate in the defaulting company. Don't you feel it's uh, against natural justice? <laughs> I made a call in one place and I am going to affect it by another case actually. Yes sir, uh, but that, that is one issue. One more issue sir is, uh, as you are aware, there are two uh, high court judgments, one in Gujarat, one in Karnataka. Uh, this again was whether this section can be applied retrospectively or prospectively? That was one question because in 2017 they disqualified I think around more than a lakh directors based on this uh, fact because they had not filed for if I am not wrong 13, 14, 12, 13 and 14, 15. So these years, these two years the Companies Act was not in force at all. So the question was will the new provisions of 2013 apply to apply retrospectively or should I see actually from 14 to 15 that is 14 to 15, 15, 16 and 16, 17 so technically will it come only in 17 or will it come retrospectively was the question they had uh, deactivated the bin of over a lakh directors so Gujarat High Court and Karnataka High Court if I am not wrong have High Court decision says that the it will never apply retrospectively so to that extent as of now it is 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17 but yes, I agree with your point, the second part whereby it goes against the principles of natural justice. Uh, but there is a split thing now in 167 whereby one part of it is, you know, uh, 164.1 you will have to vacate in the defaulting company. But 164.2 you have to vacate in other companies other than the defaulting companies. And for auditor's point of view also, it is important for us to report because we have to report under 143.3G whether any director of the company is disqualified elsewhere. So as far as reporting also is concerned, this extra thing has to be seen by the auditor, whether the director has been disqualified in any other company. So even if we are auditors of a non-defaulting company, we need to check whether the directors are disqualified elsewhere in the other companies by means of a declaration. It might be with the reason that you know that you should not commit the same thing. In the yes sir, that, that possibly is the reason. Yes, that's possibly is the reason. So, so what about independent directors? Sir, independent sir, this applies to everybody, sir. 
164 to applies to applicant. Who will come as independent director? How many directors? That's the thing, sir. Anyway, now they have also introduced a written examination uh, to be eligible to become an independent director. Yes, sir, you will not get any. As it is, 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 as
will come to that. Yeah. So the breakup is very simple now. As per the new 185, company includes both private and public. What is covered? Loan, guarantee, security, and book debt. Four things are covered: loan, guarantee, security, and book debt. So this the giver should be a private company or a public company. To whom? To directors or interested party. I have just named it, taken the liberty of naming interested party. Uh, they have defined who is this interested party as such. Interestingly, uh, in the old act, 1956, it was allowed with central government permission. In 2013, they completely prohibited the same. But in 2017, they have uh, rationalized it to a small extent where they have divided it into three sections. One, the list covered in 185.1, it is prohibited. So you cannot give loan guarantee security or any loan represented by book debt to the people covered in 185.1. And that would be the director of the company, director of the holding company, relative of the director, partner of the director and uh, no, things like that and the firm, partnership firm, the director who is a partner in various partnership firms. So loan given by private company or public company to such people under 185.1 is prohibited. Second one, restricted, 185.2, that is the other list, this is about your body corporate, a private company and other body corporate which in which uh, these, these directors have around uh, more than 25% voting power, so that is allowed but now to the extent where special resolution has to be passed and an explanatory statement has to be given and most importantly the loan should be used for the principal business activities of the company. So 185.2 only covers your private company and other body corporates, bodies corporate. On the other hand, 185.1 covers individuals, partner of the director, relative of the director and such. 185.3, there is one more section where they have said it is not applicable at all, where section 185 will not apply. Now this is the scheme of things, 185.1 is private. Now coming to private company, as I said, this still remains 5th June 2015. Now one question arises, this notification came before the amendment. This amendment came now, 7th May 2018. This amendment, whatever I am talking about, this came on with effect from 7th May 2018. But the exemption to private companies came 5th June 2015. So will the beneficial notification to private companies still apply was the question. And there have been a lot of debates and they have said it is applicable still. So, yes sir. So here it shall not apply to private company, that is 185 will not apply to a private company in whose share capital no body corporate has invested any money. So the first condition, no other body corporate should have invested money in this private company in which we are auditors. Plus the borrowings, the company can take borrowing. So if I am a private company, I can give loan guarantee security under 185.1. First of all, no other body corporate should have invested in my company. Second one, I can of course take money from banks or financial institutions or other banking companies, but it should be less than two times the paid up capital or less than 50 crore, whichever is less. That's the condition. So whatever borrowings I have taken should be less than two times the paid up capital or less than 50 crores, lesser of the two. So that calculation we have to do. Third one would be even if the second condition is followed, third one, there should not be any default in repayment of such warrants. If I am not able to follow the second condition, third condition is immaterial. But if I am able to satisfy condition number two, then under condition number three, it says there should not be any default in repayment of such warrants. So if all the three conditions are satisfied, private companies can give loan guarantee security and of course loan represented by book debt to their Yes. So normally, sir, comes uh, after notification. Normal case will come in. Correct, sir. But then there have been a couple of decisions where they say since it's beneficial in nature, it will uh, hold good. And there is no such uh, change after that. There has been no uh, uh, notification withdrawing that. Right, and that's the reason why practically people are using that. That is part of it. I shall just take five minutes and close it. Uh, then that is part 185. Then there is one more interesting section 186 that again again talks about loan guarantee security interestingly. So company, what company that again is covered, private company, public company. What all is covered here? Loan guarantee security and investment. 
So there it was book debt and now it is replaced by the investment here. To whom? Here we, it is anybody corporate or any person. Person here should be seen as an individual, anybody corporate or person. And investment obviously in the securities of a body corporate. So that is what they say. Investment in the securities of a body corporate. Here the person would it include employees also. If the company gives loan to its employees, should they follow the rigors of 186 or the question? No, they will not. Yes sir, correct. It was a rule before, now they have inserted a proviso in 2017 where they say employees are not covered. So of course you can give loan without following section 186. So what are the provisions here quickly? Up to when I, if I am giving, if the private company, public company is giving up to 60% of paid up share capital, free reserve, security plan account, or 100% of free reserve, security plan, whichever is higher, a board meeting resolution has to be passed. And interestingly, this board meeting resolution has to be unanimous. That is one unanimous resolution that is needed. And if I go beyond this limit, then of course prior special resolution and board meeting resolution is needed. So this is for 186. Now there may be one question that arises that if I am giving loan to a director which is prohibited under 185.1, can I give it under 186? Yes, employee. An employee, yes. But a normal director who is an employee was the question. So that again if you are a managing director or a whole time director alone, then you can give a loan because that is covered under the exemption 185 subsection 3. Because in 185 subsection 3 they say loan given to managing director or whole time director if you have passed a scheme or if it's approved by a I mean that is special resolution or if it's as part of your conditions of service itself, employment then you can give. Employment scheme. Yes, sir. Yes. But if you are a director to whom it is prohibited under 185, who cannot take recourse to 186 because it will dilute the provision 185. So practically uh, what we need to see, I will just come to that. So 185 speaks about prohibition of loans to directors, 186 speaks about loans guarantee uh, security to any person that is board meeting resolution and special resolution. There is one more section, residuary section 179 3F which says here mind you unanimous resolution is needed. Here there is no unanimous resolution, simple majority. And interestingly under 179 3F, I can give loan also by delegation. As in the board can delegate it to the managing director to give loan. Now the question is where to follow what? What is the structure that you need to follow and do in the audit? How to check? So one provision says prohibited. One section says it is restricted. Special resolution and board meeting resolution unanimous and all that. Third one says that you can easily delegate it to the MD and he can go ahead and give the loan. So the question was what structure to follow, harmonious construction would not be possible in this uh, thing. So very simple, first I need to check whether that entire loan is given to a person prohibited under 185.1. If he is prohibited then no loan can be given to that person obviously. And that person includes director, partner, relative and the firm in which the director or relative is a partner, four things. If the loan to be given by the company is not to such person under 185.1, then I need to go to 185.2. 185.2 as discussed is restricted to the list of bodies, corporate and private company, whereas discussed special resolution is there and uh, principal business activities and of course explanatory statement. If I have followed 185 then I need to stop there. But if it is to a person who is not covered under 185 then I need to go ahead and check whether it is covered under 185 3. 185 3 covers, as I told you, managing director, whole time director and holding subsidiary relationships also are covered. So technically then I will have to go to 186. And even if 186 is not covered, 186 is not there. For example, employees where 186 also will not come. And there is one more section, 186 subsection 11. Certain companies like insurance companies, banking companies, uh, investment in right shares, they do not, they need not go through 186. For such uh, sections, I need to go to 179.3. So that is the residuary section. This is the structure which would be easy for the auditor to check for compliance of these particular sections. 
So I think uh, the time is up. Uh, I there are so many other things to discuss, but because of lack of time, no problem. So I thank the Bangalore branch of SIRC for giving me an opportunity to come and share my views on the uh, changes and. I also thank you for being patient and also uh, discussing your practical issues also with me. It was a good learning for me also. Uh, so thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Awesome presentation. All his dedication is seen in the presentation which he has provided because I think he has spent a lot of many hours or days to present in such a, a formatted manner to make us understand all the sections of companies act. So let's give a big hand of uh, applause for the great speaker and he has taken care in providing us the visual uh, memories by writing it in the notepad in his laptop. It's already awesome. So let's present him a uh, as a gratitude of a great fortune on, our behalf, on behalf of Bangalore Branch and all of us. Please give a big round of applause. So here we are for a small tea break, uh, snack break upstairs. Please.